Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is a special program dedicated to remembering Alex Thanos, a doctor of divinity, a man with great psychic talents, a man who served with the American Society for Psychical Research in New York for 20 years. He is the author of several books, including Beyond Coincidence, One Man's Experience with Psychic Phenomena, is Your Child Psychic? A Guide to Developing Your Child's Psychic Abilities, Dreams, Symbols, and Psychic Power, and two books published posthumously, Conversations with Ghosts and Psy in Psychotherapy, Conventional and Unconventional Healing of Mental Illness. Now, the first part of this program today will be a 15-minute archival video made with Alex Tanis. So, you'll hear him speaking about his out-of-body travel in his own words. Then the second part of today's program will be an interview uh, that I've conducted with Lloyd Auerbach. Lloyd was, a, a, in a sense, a protege of Alex Tanis. He worked with him for a couple of years at the American Society for Psychical Research. Lloyd has been a guest on this channel many times. He is the author of many books, Mind Over Matter, ESP Hauntings and Poltergeists, Reincarnation, Channeling and Possession, Psychic Dreaming, Ghost Hunting, and he co-authored with Ed May, Joe McMonagall, and Victor Rubel, ESP Wars, East and West. He's also on the board of directors of the Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, where he also teaches online parapsychology courses. So, now we will switch over to the part one of uh, this two-part uh, program today, the archival video with Alex Tanis. Alex, how would you describe an out-of-body experience? An out-of-body experience for me, a separation of my consciousness uh, from my body, which is able to perceive on its own. In other words, it's able to see my body down here, where I'm lying now, or that, that my consciousness will go to Peru, uh, will go anywhere in the world and perceive what is there and bring back the information. And therefore, it is a separation of the consciousness. That would be the, the simplest explanation I could give you. Well, what happens uh, in the brain? when the mind or the consciousness uh, appears to be projected elsewhere? We have found that there are changes in the brain. Um, I seem to go into an altered state of consciousness. Not seem, I do go into an altered state of consciousness. Therefore, there is a change in the brain when it happens. And it's a marvelous brain, a marvelous experience for me. Uh, whatever is registered, I there's a state that I go into, which is a oneness uh, with the universe, and they're able to pick that up on the EEG. And... Uh, it's a, a state of consciousness where there is complete harmony. And I, I love it. I always say I don't want to come back. <laughs> how, how do you see, Alex, uh, when, when you're out of body? When I'm out of body, in the very beginning, I have to say that it was a, a light projection. By light projection, I mean I was a ball of light. Now I have a physical, a, a double, just like me. And what happens from this booth, this isolated booth, to where the experiment takes place, I observe him, which is created, a physical, and he does all the things I want done. In other words, he is there in a flash. In other words, the experiment we're going to see, during that experiment, your body will remain in this isolation box. That's right. 
But your mind will be about five rooms from here. Yes, but even more, I call it the Alex too. He is actually physically there, and I see him from here. You do? Yes. But and no that, one else in that no, room No one see. else. This is the next step in the our experiment where they're going to show that it can be done through a special camera, which we hope to put together. But there is a, what is important here is that there is something physical in the other room, which is five doors away from here, about 50 feet. Now, what happens in the spot where the, this consciousness is being projected? Well, what happens is first it is registered on a strain gauge, which then appears on the EEG. And at the same time, I'm able to read uh, targets that they have for me in front of me. And through that, they know that I'm physically present. Because the targets are an optical illusion. Can you share with us some of the experiences you've had? You've been going through these experiments for 10 years now. I started out at the age of five when I saw my first separation at the age of five. And it intrigued me to, to wonder what this was all about. And then at the age of nine years old, I had an operation. And I had an out-of-body experience. It means I saw myself on the operating table. But then everything disappeared. And I went into another dimension, which was so beautiful. It was energy. And this energy was coming towards me, just filling me up and... As I looked at myself, it looked like a white robe, and I saw people around me. I saw my father with, uh, uh, not my father, my grandfather, whom I had never seen, and my gr and some other people. And suddenly, I became all my life, and it was a very, very beautiful experience. And I, I realized I had to be something to it. And I never spoke about it, except to my parents, who were psychic. And all they said, you've been gifted. You've something very special happened to you. And from that day on, I never feared death. But then when I religion began to preach brimstone and fire, and I couldn't buy it. So through that and through several ex near-death experiences and the death of my brother, one of my, my, my seventh brother, all of that said, there's a journey you have to take, a journey that you have to reveal to people that you there is life after death. You have had a near-death experience. I've had four near-death experiences. Describe one. What, the, the most beautiful one was the, I think the most fullest one was the last experience that I had. Um, I had 105 temperature and I saw myself on the table and suddenly something, my outer body or my, there was a separation of energy, uh, consciousness, and I saw my body on the table and suddenly I saw a line which was dark, and I, um, I wanted to get through that line uh, to the other side. It was beautiful to the other side, and there were people still on this side of the line uh, trying to get over. Uh, that part I don't understand, and suddenly I find myself on the other side, and I look at myself, and I could touch myself, and I was just as physical as I am now, and all of a sudden, uh, I saw my parents who had died, and friends, and everything else, and the energy... And the light, I have to say, came pouring inside of me, and I looked at myself, and there I was, like a white robe. And I relived my life. It was a, the most beautiful moment in my, in my whole life. I, I, I was one with the universe, and I, I just didn't want to come back. And I went beyond the near-death experience, because I saw the future of my own life, which I don't remember. And that's when I decided that I had to come back. And it, it was just beautiful. Uh, is the mind so powerful that it can survive at the moment of death? Uh, to me, yes. It's so powerful because it needs, in itself, it needs to survive. That's the way I feel, as much as it needs to think, as much as it, we need to uh, learn. And to me, I, I think we're just going back to the fulfillment of what Mankind was at the very beginning, so not something that we've lost, but something, a transition that we've been gained through and returning to immortality. Alex, there are many viewers, I'm sure, who are very skeptical, many who would say this is a lot of malarkey. I mean, how do you get anyone to understand that what you're saying is not fantasy, but reality? Well, there are two things here. My near-death experiences, I think anyone who had gone through one will share the experience and that you can't, you can't give to anybody. I wish I could. 
But I think the work that we're doing here under the scientific eye, and that we're able to relate or correlate what happens in the near, at least in the beginning of the near-death experience, that there is a separation, I think that will, people will see much more actual and much more uh, factual until they have their own experience. But I think the, the work that we're being done and the work that's being reported by medical doctors, because there's so many new books out now where people have said that they have separated themselves and had seen themselves on the operating table or trying to be revived and so forth. So I think that now that other disciplines like uh, physics, medicine, uh, psychology, all of them are agreeing that it's no longer a fantasy, that a real experience takes place and that we have to. And to me, it is a religious experience. Perhaps more than a religious, I think a spiritual experience, because none of my religious training took me into this dimension. No, it was brimstone and fire, and you know you're going to burn in hell. But there's nothing of that. It's a joyful experience. You know, it's so it's so beautiful that we should wait for it with great joy. You claim you claim that after ten years of experimentation, you have absolutely determined that there are out of body experiences. What can be done? with this knowledge? Well, the first knowledge, I think, we are sharing our knowledge with other disciplines so that they can uh, know where to go from there in the medical work, the physics, and so forth. That's, I think that's one of the great things when other disciplines can join us. And secondly, it's giving spirituality and religion and philosophy a new dimension also, a new thought of what has passed gone, especially coming from the laboratory work. And thirdly, I think that it's, no, I think, no, that what different people are using this, like helping the police uh, solve murder cases, lost people, uh, find lost sitters, archaeological work, and even people who are like myself with diagnosed cases, and even more, something I've very rarely spoken about, where I can, I have touched people who had cancer, like pituitary gland, and it disappeared. So the energy is there, and it's a physical energy, as long as, a, but it's a spiritual energy. How do you explain all of this? I explain that, well, to some people it would be very hard, that I would say I'm in the heart of God. And we all are, and we haven't seen it. I'm not saying fully, but I've touched something, or someone, someone has touched me and somebody loves me. And is harnessing that energy through your mind? Through my mind, because the mind to me is spiritual, and once you get into that spiritual dimension, it's uh, it's a, it's something you can't speak about. I, it's something that you have to experience. And to be able to bring that or to show that it can be done, then this universe, through meditation, through other means, will be able to work it to you know bring our minds to a higher degree where we can bring peace and wisdom. Everybody says bring love, but we have to bring wisdom before love. We're talking, the thesis of our whole thing here is the power within. just like to ask you for briefly if you would relate to that, and talking the power within, with you know, dealing with out-of-body experiences, what, what the harnessing of that power. Just kind of a statement for me. Well, once we harness that power, we'll be able to do everything we want to do without being tied down to this Talking about harnessing the power of the mind. The power of the I'm mind. I'm just trying to get a full statement from That's you. That's right. What I'm saying is that what would happen would be I would be able to move this body to another place without taking an aeroplane. In other words, we could do a lot of things. We could transform this body and mankind would not have to die. That's, that, that, that's all hard, very hard to comprehend for it me is. and for an audience. I'd like, yeah. like you to pick up on that again, uh, Alex. And uh, you do. Well, all right. Let's, words, I'm, I'm looking for a full sentence. Okay. Full sentence. Let's say that if we can look at this power like electricity, which we don't know what it is, and if we can harness it like electricity, then look at everything that electricity has done. We will do that a million times more because the power that we have is stronger than any power there is. By harnessing the power of our own minds. That's right. What do you project to be done in the future? In the future, I believe that mankind will become immortal. How? By letting this energy take over the matter and transforming it. In other words, long after death, our minds will survive. Survive. And while we are alive, I believe we're going to come to that point where we won't have to die. That our mind will take over the body and heal it forever. 
In other words, the mind will heal the body and mankind will not have to die. Because our greatest crutch and our greatest fear is maybe there's nothing on the other side. We don't know. No matter how many test tubes we try and how many experiments, we don't have the proof. What we're touching here is a direction, but not the whole universe will believe it. Until you experience it, and I believe that the power of the mind is a personal experience. While we were taping in this isolation box, some strange things happened involving our crew. For one thing, a red light started flashing in our camera. Then we saw kind of a, a jumping of our picture where it was out of sync. Then moments later, our, our beeper went off and no one was calling us. To what would you attribute that? Well, if I go back to the past and so, some of the things that have happened, there, there was a point when my energy is very, very high and it happened here. Uh, working with the crew, the positiveness and the excitement that, that I wanted to perform to show what was going on by performing really showing the interior that was happening. So my energy was very, very high and the light that you were shining on me, I can absorb light, even the sun into my eyes. Everything combined, um, which I've seen before, caused things to trigger off and things to happen. And to have you ever experienced anything like this before? Yes, I have. One time we were doing a, 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 another television show and they weren't able when they developed the film to show it, I was in it, was not in it, only my voice. And I've triggered off... There was no image at all? No image whatsoever. And the, the, when they showed it on television, they said, there's nothing wrong with your TV. He told us we wouldn't be able to fill him in. And, we'll, and they superimposed the picture. And they just let the conversation go. Alex, tell us briefly, what, what are we about to see in this experiment? In this experiment, I will be projecting my consciousness, Alex 2, 50 feet away into a strain gauge box which will measure m my physical presence. At the same time, I will be reading targets that they will select randomly by push button, which I will be reading to show that I'm actually there. In these two facets, it will show uh, you how my, I leave my body and what can be done with it. And therefore, it will be registered on the EEG as we go along. When Alex 2 is projected 50 feet from here, what is Alex 1 doing in this chamber? Alex 1 is observing what is taking place and reading what's going on. He will describe what's taking place in, in, the, in the 50 feet away. I actually see the other room and it's all open to me from here. Now, have you seen any of the equipment that's in there or what's going to be projected? Before? No, I have not. I know the experiment itself. I know that there's a, a wheel with four colors on it. They will project a series of pictures on there. I, I know what the pictures are. In other words, by saying that I know what the pictures are, there are five pictures that they will randomly show on that. But by pressing a button, everything interlocks. So I don't know what interlocks. And that's what is the importance, is the importance what interlocks in there. Welcome, Lloyd. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. You worked at the American Society for Psychical Research for a couple of years back in the 1980s and uh, had an opportunity to work closely with Alex Tanis at that time. I sure did. Uh, I was working in the education department from the beginning of 1982 till about mid-1983 after which I left to come back to JFK University. How did he strike you uh, personally? Was he easy to get along with? You know, Alex was an incredibly gregarious man, uh, very outgoing, uh, really understanding of, of people, very compassionate. He kind of very, came across as very compassionate and very social, and he had a real wicked sense of humor. You were also, I gather at that time, uh, although you were in the education department, you occasionally went out on field investigations. Yeah, so my position was working as a media liaison between the ASPR and the press, uh, anyone else, and also to help uh, with education outreach. But I also fielded questions that came in, cases that came in, uh, which would typically come to the education department first before being filtered out to Dr. Osis for looking at investigations. And because I lived in Westchester County, 
north of New York City. It was easier for me to go out on cases that came in in that area than for anyone else. So I was kind of the front man for a lot of those. And I consulted with Alex and Dr. Osis and Donna McCormick on those cases. Also had some of my own cases coming in because I was teaching adult ed at a variety of places. And Alex uh, is a very unusual person in the history of parapsychology, being both a researcher and a psychic. And on top of that, he had a doctoral degree in theology. Yeah, he uh, was incredibly knowledgeable about, about theology, which really helped him when he ran into people who were trying to quote the Bible against psychics. Uh, he knew chapter and verse and how to uh, really refute that. He was versed well enough in science, certainly, while that wasn't his real background. He knew parapsychology. In fact, he was teaching parapsychology courses at the University of Southern Maine. And, of course, he was really the research subject, although he was involved in research. Uh, he was mainly the research subject in the out-of-body experience work that was done at the ASPR. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I recall in uh, one of our previous interviews on ghost hunting, you pointed out that when you go out on a case, you allow yourself to uh, pay attention to your own intuitive impressions. And uh, I imagine that that was probably a, a lesson you learned from working with Alex. Absolutely. In fact, I have to say that uh, my time at the ASPR was really great for me as a field investigator. I had Dr. Osis as the science uh, my mentor and Alex as the psychic mentor. And Alex encouraged me. Our, our, we had a lot of conversations about this, about, about phenomena, about apparitions and hauntings and poltergeists, about all sorts of psychic experiences. And he really encouraged me to be aware of what I was experiencing as an investigator, even if I wasn't going to be the so-called psychic in the investigation, I should be really well aware because that will also help me working with psychics and mediums down the road. And he was absolutely right about that. In the book, Conversations with Ghosts, which was published posthumously based on some chapters that Alex had written, he, he develops a whole theory uh, about how to handle poltergeist cases. And by handle, I mean get the phenomenon to stop. Uh, basically, because they're typically the uh, inhabitants of a home are disturbed by poltergeist activity. And he felt that uh, there were usually issues that needed to be, in his words, reconciled. And once the reconciliation happened, the phenomena uh, would go away. Uh, is that your experience as well? There, you know, when we look at the phenomena of poltergeist, itself, we're talking about generally physical phenomena, and that's distinguishable from apparitional phenomena, even apparition cases where phenomena, where physical things are happening. Um, and Alex was a big proponent of diplomacy with the dead and the living, both. Uh, the whole idea of approaching a poltergeist case to resolve issues, because it's usually some kind of stress issue or an issue that's causing stress that has to be identified that is behind whoever the poltergeist agent is, the living person. But even with apparitions, there is often conflict or issues of the apparition that have to be dealt with through other kinds of diplomacy or, or in that case, counseling. He, he seemed to feel that these ghosts, as he called them, uh, had a story to tell, and, and they were yeah. largely causing disturbances because they needed to communicate some grievance or, or some history, some story. And once he heard their story, they were apparently willing to go away and no longer bother the inhabitants of, of a house. Well, a lot of the apparition cases that Alex dealt with uh, and that we talked about, the apparition, the entity themselves, uh, that person, was uh, the unresolved issue or the issue they had, because it wasn't always unresolved. It wasn't that kind of thing. Sometimes it was just a matter of, hey, I'm here. And any escalation, so typically a case might start out with people seeing or experiencing the apparition, and then they might eventually have physical phenomena happening. All they wanted to do is say, hey, I'm here. You know, I'm still around. There might be more to it in those cases, but it was really phenomenal often would happen. And this has been my experience since then with apparition cases. A lot of times things escalate only because the family or the people living in the home are ignoring 
the knock knock. <laughs> they're they're <laughs> ignoring that. <laughs> I, I suppose ignoring it is is a, a natural human response because you don't, most people, I should think, don't want to accept that there's something of a paranormal nature going on in their house. They'd rather think it's it's just some quirk or, you, you know, a creaky house and it'll go away or maybe it's the weather. I, I think most people, although today we have a slightly different uh, pop culture perspective and pop culture landscape because of the ghost hunting shows. Um, most people who have single, these kinds of experiences, unfortunately today will react in fear because they've been taught that if they've seen those shows, but if they haven't seen those shows and are not tapped into that, yeah, they tend to ignore these things right away. Um, they will assume that it's just something trick of the light or something else. And, you know, frankly, and this is something else I learned from both Alex and Dr. Osis, is that even in the best of these cases, you had some phenomena that they reported, the family would report, that had explanation to it. Uh, Alex was a, a proponent of taking apart the case and looking at each element and seeing whether that was related to an apparition, a poltergeist, a haunting, you know, or an imprint of some kind. Before, you know, figure out if there's an explanation for it before you actually pronounce it, whatever. Did you have any involvement in the out-of-body research that was done with Alex? I didn't have any direct involvement with the out-of-body research with Alex. Uh, I was around it quite a bit. I certainly talked, talked with him and with Dr. Osis about it. I guess my involvement was with a couple TV companies and helping them shape their stories around what was being done there. They're probably more than that. That, um, But I worked with Alex. I spent a lot of time talking to Alex because I was really interested in his perspective on things since I hadn't had that time previously to sit down with someone who was definitely a good psychic. And we had law enforcement coming by every time Alex was down there and I was at, at work. I worked part-time at the ASPR. Someone from New York, P, you know, New York Police Department, Boston PD, the FBI, someone from law enforcement would be consulting with Alex. And I gather he actually worked on law enforcement cases, but uh, to my knowledge, none of those have been published. He was asked, and this is what he told me, he was asked to make them, uh, to allow the police to work with him to not tell anybody he was doing these cases. Because unfortunately, between the skeptics and other people in the public and the religious side of things, knowing that the police would consult a psychic at all could cause problems. And to this day, it still causes problems for some police. Uh, but he did, he was involved with some high profile cases back then. So uh, the ASPR had a good relationship with these law enforcement agencies, that I have to presume. You know, I, I don't know that the the law enforcement folks consulted anyone else at the ASPR at all. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a matter of Alex being down from Maine for the ASPR that brought them to the ASPR to consult, because he also want, typically wanted them to come to him. Uh, oh, okay, well, then one has to uh, assume that they had a good experience with Alex and they're coming back for more. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you talk about how successful some something is, just like with the remote viewing program with Stargate, uh, the Stargate program, when you have either agencies or law enforcement coming back again and again, it's the same agencies coming back again and again, there's something, they're obviously getting something out of it. So something is helping them. The one thing I, I will say, which is what Alex taught me way back when, and it's very, very clear because I have worked with psychics who have worked with police since then, is that when you see psychics on TV who claim to have solved the crime, that's not the case. I mean, real, in reality, in order to bring someone to justice, you have to have evidence. And maybe the psychic has pointed them to the right suspect to focus on. Or maybe the psychic has pointed them to where the evidence can be found. But really, it's the police that solved the crime. The psychic is just one of those tools that the police would use. And that's one of the things he taught me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was also known for producing phenomena. For example, uh, in his introduction to the book, Conversations with Ghosts, Callum Cooper reports uh, that 
Alex was able to create spots of light. He could kind of uh, point his hand, I guess, at the wall, and and it would glow as if he was pointing a flashlight. I understand that's the case. I, I never saw him do that, um, unfortunately, but uh, he definitely impressed me with some of the other things that he did. What, what are some of the things that you observed? Well, I really think it was around the out of body research. He, you know, the way OSIS had it set up, he was he really impressed me as as actually doing something. You know, beside the idea that uh, the, they had two elements to this: one was informational, and one was physical. Uh, so the idea was for Alex to jump out of body. He would create this what he would call a projection, Alex two, uh, and one of the things really important to get across about Alex's attitude is that he felt that if his spirit left his body, he'd be dead. So he would project part of his consciousness out. That was Alex II. Alex II would go into the box, jump around, affect the train gauges. And you could see this on the chart recorder, that this was actually happening. And then he would get information coming back from the actual target system. So that was pretty pretty impressive. Um, The stories that I heard from him about some of the experiences he had outside the lab in a couple of cases, I was able to talk to the witnesses to them. There were a couple of cases of bilocation, people having seen him and interacted with his out-of-body presence. And probably the most impressive thing for me personally was him telling me that I would have experiences while working with him. And I did. I had a series of different, different and out-of-body bilocation experiences, psychokinesis experiences, a bunch of other things too. That gives me the impression, and I've heard it from other individuals as well, that when you hang out with somebody who has these psychic abilities, some of it rubs off on you. I I think what really rubs off is once you really get that that's real, and I had already gotten that it was real, but once you really kind of, it, it comes into your person, and that person encourages you to be more psychic, encourages you to develop this to be open to this because he's that's something something he made very clear to me in my investigations uh to really be open to the information not necessarily be the psychic but to be open to whatever else i picked up that's really good advice uh and i i I asked him flat out alex what's the first step in becoming more psychic and his response was notice that you already are that's a, a wonderful piece of advice because most people are going to pick up what we call intuitive impressions every day. Yeah, and he uh, had he had this real this really great exercise which he told me he got from memory training that I've been teaching my students since then, which is almost meditative. So when people are looking for a good meditative practice, I I give them this also. Uh, the notice that you already are the problem with that, as he put it was that all of our normal perceptions get in the way. So how do you notice that you're already getting information that's, that's not from your normal senses? And he said, by focusing on each of your senses for a few minutes every day separately. So focus on everything you see and then everything you hear and try smelling things and tasting things and just feeling your clothes against your skin and your butt in the chair and your shoes on your feet. All of that, you'll suddenly, after a few weeks and maybe not even that long, uh, notice that there's extra information that you can't pin down to your normal senses. It may be visual, but it's not coming through your eyes. Well, now, you also mentioned that you had out-of-body experiences while you were with him? Yes. Um, Alex had told me a couple of his bilocation experiences. And, of course, I was very well aware of the out-of-body work there, um, one of which involved him apparently resting in New York right before a lecture and projecting Alex too out of himself to visit a friend in Canada who was involved in the Canadian government. Uh, and I talked to that guy. <laughs> he, get, he gave me the number. I called him, and it was all verified that Alex showed up at his house as well. So that I don't know what that, what ha- that did for me, but I had gotten to know some folks in some of my classes pretty well, uh, became friends with a, a local psychic, who was taking my parapsychology classes, and apparently during one of my dreams about her and her um, 20-year-old daughter, I popped into their house in the middle of the night. They were late. They didn't go to sleep till four in the morning. And she called me a couple days later. I I knew I'd had this dream, and she called me, and she said, you had a dream about me, and she told me what had happened. And then a couple weeks later, 
during a very, very boring event that I was at, I felt myself in two places at once. And she looked up from a book and had a conversation and we took notes down and compared notes a couple of days later. Uh, Alex explained it all to me as, as basically him telling me the experience and hearing from the other person and all the stuff that I was around, around the OBE stuff, triggered my own intention to really have these experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a very unusual thing that you just described, feeling yourself being in two different places simultaneously. It, it was really very strange. I was very well aware of where I was, my body was, but I also had this really strong physical feeling and mental impression of being in my friend's home uh, and having the conversation with her. Uh, You know, I'm imagining that there are probably all sorts of other sensations associated with this, and the English language doesn't even have good words for them. You know, the problem we have in general, uh, we we talk about the emotions that we even have. You know, how do when you say I'm in love, people can see other people can see the outward expressions of that. But what does that feel to you? And it may not feel to me the same way it feels to you. Or being angry may not have the same internal feeling, but same possibly the same ex- external um, conditions you can see about me, but just not the same. So our language is woefully inaccurate when it comes to that sort of thing. Subjective experience. Tell me more about bi- biolocation. If you're experiencing yourself in two places at once, one of them is your physical body. And, and so, uh, were your eyes open or closed, for example? My eyes were open. Um, so, the scenario, the situation was that I was at a friend's bachelor party. This is in the early 80s, of course. So, a bunch of guys at my friend's apartment. He was getting married a couple days later. And they decided to do what many guys do, which is watch porn. <laughs> um, something I could never understand why that was really interesting to do with a group of guys. Um, <laughs> make more sense to watch with women. So I was getting kind of bored, actually, yeah, to be honest. Sure. And I went to, my friend's, went to my friend's kitchen. I could still see out into the living room what they were doing and fix myself a drink. And that's when I felt this whole shift mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. Um, so... I was standing there in the kitchen, you know, looking out. Uh, My eyes were open. The glass was in my hand. I wasn't certainly, I don't think I was physically moving when I felt myself popping into my friend's uh, house or living room. The the same house? This was 50 miles away. Okay. Okay. So you're standing in the kitchen, but you notice that part of you is also in another house 50 miles away. Yes, that's right. With my friend Danita, who was a psychic, who lived in the area. I, I see. And you're able to see, in effect, through two pairs of eyes. It, it was a really weird sensation. Yeah, very, very weird sensation. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, the best I can put it to is if you're, well, we're looking at each other right now. But if I were to try to visualize an apple, or if you were to visualize an apple at the same time you're looking at me, you can kind of hold two images. One is through your eye, and the other is your mind's, your mind's eye. So it's, it's kind of like that. That makes sense. Did you interact with the uh, psychic at the, in the other home? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, I showed up there. She puts down her book and says, okay, what's going on now? <laughs> And we had a conversation about, I told her about the bachelor party. Uh, We had a conversation about my experience, what was going on. Um, I snapped back and looked around, found some paper, wrote down some notes. I had told her when I was out of body to write down notes. And I called her the next morning and she said, I hope you took notes too. (laughs) So we compared notes and the conversations matched. How interesting. Now, has that happened uh, a lot uh, since then, or was that a one-time experience? Well, that and the one I had the dream, when I had the dream experience with her. um, The same lady, yeah. The same lady, yeah. Those are the only times that that happened. Uh, I had a couple PK experiences during that year and a half I was working with Alex. Uh, I had a couple of precognitive dreams, several, actually a few precognitive dreams, nothing major, 
all very mundane type things. So it was as if, and he, he explained this to me, he says, being around the research, being around, and he said, being around me, because you're open to it, and because you want to, you're going to have these experiences to keep you interested. Yeah. And, and I presume, of course, you shared these experiences with him. Oh, sure. Yeah. With him, with Dr. Osis, Donna. Yeah. With everybody. And they were all in, encouraging, I presume. Yes. Yeah. See, th that alone is, is very rare. Most people don't live in a social environment where you can share those kinds of experiences and get positive feedback from your colleagues and friends. Well, you know, being in this field, as you know, we have a lot of contacts <laughs> and we attract people to, our, to ourselves, some of whom are too, a little too believing, but there's enough people out there that are very interested in this that really want to hear these things. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any other stories about Alex that would be uh, worth uh, repeating while we're discussing your memories of him? During the time that I was at the ASPR was when Project Alpha happened. Oh, which was yes. James Randi's, um, some people call it the Shazam scam, uh, where, where he kind of scammed some researchers. And... Alex had very strong opinions about Randy. In fact, he had told me he had been on two television shows. OSIS confirmed this, uh, local, where Randy was also on the shows. Uh, he was always able to keep up with the skeptics. That's one thing I can say, because he was so knowledgeable about the research, not just about his own experience. Uh, he was very, very able to keep up with the skeptics. And from what I gathered, Randy did not think very highly of him, especially after he apparently embarrassed Randy on a couple of TV programs. And this is what he and Dr. Osis told me. Because uh, Randy used to say, and I had heard Randy say this, that he would carry around, at that point it was a $10,000 challenge. And he would say, I carried around the $10,000 check. So, you know, he challenges people. And he was challenging people at that time. Uh, and on the sh these two shows, apparently he challenged Alex. And Alex said, okay, let's see the check. And both times Randy didn't have the check. <laughs> you would have thought that after the first time he would have remembered to bring it with him <laughs> um, I, I can also you know, I interviewed Alex and Dr. Osis about the Amityville case because the two of them were involved in looking into the Lutz family house uh, got their perspective on the experience and it was really interesting to, to hear, I interviewed a number of people I interviewed Jerry Salfin and George Kokoris uh, Keith Harari some folks who were involved in investigations of that, that place. And Alex always made the distinction, which is something I, I really got from him. Uh, I had gotten it before in, in, in some of the coursework at JFK in my parapsychology studies, partly from you, I think, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Alex made it really clear that he, it's important to distinguish between what he called um, psychic movies or imprints what people call residual hauntings or place memory, and actual conscious entities. And when he walked into, he and Osis went through the Lutz house in Amityville, uh, he was already aware that there had been that awful murder by Rod, Ronald DeFeo. He killed, Ronald DeFeo killed his entire family. So he was aware of that. And he was very well aware of um, just small details that had been published in the papers about it. But he was not aware of the full scope and he certainly had never been in the house before. And what he described was walking through the house. Al Osis described this as well, uh, described walking through with Alex, and Alex describing what he was picking up on of the murders, uh, actually literally narrating what he saw had happened there, which apparently dovetailed with what the police knew as well later on. No spirits, nothing evil. I mean, there was a, a horrible thing that happened. He said, for that perspective, the feeling was bad, no question about it. Uh, but there was no conscious anything that was there that could have attacked the family. So then on, on the way, what Alex actually said on the way out, and Ovisus again said this, is that they were looking around and right before they left, uh, two things happened. Number one, he went over to a bureau in the, the dining room or living room and he opened a drawer and he found a book contract. Apparently there was already a contract for a book this is only three weeks after the Lutz has moved out, apparently, three or four weeks. The second thing that happened is the door opens up 
and a uh, camera crew comes in with Ed and Lorraine Warren uh, and a, a pretty much a media circus. And Alex described looking at Dr. Osis uh, and saying, you know, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they scooted before the circus actually came to town as much as possible. But he was convinced, they were convinced that um, other than picking up on what had happened, which the family certainly could have done, uh, that this was not, not real, certainly not the way it was described. And in other words, no ghosts. No ghosts, no evil entities, nothing other than the impression, the emotional stuff that was left behind, and the impression of the tale killing his family. Now, as I recall, Alex also didn't really believe in evil entities or uh, demons. As far as he said, there is no such thing as as an evil ghost. Right. You know, uh, know, that's the thing. I was in complete agreement. I'd, I'd studied... Uh, cultural anthropology in college, undergrad, and looked at, and dealt with a lot of supernatural folklore and beliefs of people around the world. And my professors were of the same opinion that people do evil things, but there's no like concerted evil force. And Alex was of the opinion. Uh, first of all, he didn't think that murderers, dead people who are killers, stick around. She, he felt that they didn't stick around. And actually, I've heard the same thing from Carlos Alvarado, who did some did some research on that. And other, other researchers historically that the, the awful serial killer ghosts don't seem to exist. But he did feel that some people could be bullies and obnoxious and some other words that I'm not going to use since, you know, I don't want to say, it, want to say them. <laughs> um, and I, that's been my experience as well, is, you know, if you're an ass in life, you're going to be an ass in death. And <laughs> that doesn't make you evil or malevolent. But it does make you not somebody you want to be with. Yeah. Well, Lloyd Auerbach, thank you so much for sharing these reflections on uh, a very important figure in the history of uh, parapsychology and psychical research. I think Alex's work is underrated. Um, He's got, there's some really great stuff that he's written over the years. I'm glad Cal is bringing it out now. And uh, all I can say is that people need to be really aware of Alex Tanis.